Welcome to day three of the 2021 Aspen Ideas Festival. I'm Zinclea Samoa, or at Simply Zinclea, your host for this annual celebration. For 17 years, the Aspen Institute has gathered people from around the world over to Colorado in the summer for presentations, demonstrations, and conversations, both on and off the stage. Today, we'll talk about building better internet through the lens of an empowering dating app, Bumble. We'll look into the future of the American city with someone who leads one, Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago. And then we'll talk about humanity's search for intelligent life elsewhere in the universe and what it says about humanity itself. Thank you for joining us. First, we'll welcome or swipe right for Whitney Wolf Hurt, founder of the social and dating app Bumble. Time Magazine's Charlotte Alter will ask her for her thoughts on regulating the internet, and they might not be what you'd expect from a tech CEO. Welcome to Aspen Ideas. My name is Charlotte Alter. I'm a senior correspondent at Time, and I'm so excited to be joined here by Whitney Wolf Hurd, founder and CEO of Bumble. Hey, Whitney, how are you? Hi, Charlotte. Great to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's so great to see you again. Um, I feel like this has been such an exciting year for you with Bumble going public and with all of the exciting uh, new adventures in sort of online relationship building that we've seen in the last year. Um, I'm wondering, you know, you've this year, you took your company public, you became one of the youngest self-made women billionaires in the world. Um, how is Bumble different than all of these other sort of uh, social discovery apps because of who you are, because of your experience as a young woman in, in this field? Yeah, well, it has been a crazy year for sure. Um, I think everyone is, you know, losing track days, months, weeks, years. Uh, it's all blending together at this point. But so what I, what I think sets Bumble apart is that, you know, we built this with the lens of what does a woman want when she builds relationships and what does a woman not want, maybe even more importantly, right? And when you look at the beginning of this chapter of this story of Bumble is 2014. And I would say two things were fundamentally true and clear, actually three things. So thing one, that the internet had really no stance on toxicity or harassment. And it was pretty much a free for all. Uh, you could say what you wanted to say, even if it was going to cause someone extreme pain, grief, and emotional, maybe even physical um, trauma. Thing two is that this was um, 2014, as I said, and it was still incredibly uh, stigmatized for a woman to approach a man, if we're talking about heteronormative, heterosexual relationships, to approach a man first at a bar or on a product, a digital product or, you know, in any kind of format. And then the third thing was there was this emergence of online dating. It was just starting to explode. But the reality was as fast as it exploded, it very much turned into a um, mechanism for harassment, abuse, and bad behavior. So that exploded with it. And so, you know, my approach with Bumble was really looking at all three of those things and understanding where do they intersect and how can we try to solve for these things with a product brand company all aim to put women at the forefront versus making them the afterthought so one of the things that i think is so interesting about bumble is that you've set out to build an app that uh you know one aims to sort of use the internet to shape the way humans behave both online and off I'm curious what you've learned about human behavior on the way. You know, you've been doing this now for a couple of years. What has surprised you? Yeah, a lot has surprised me, uh, fortunately and unfortunately. Something that has really surprised me is the power of rejection and just mm -hmm. how powerful that one moment can be and how it can define what happens next. So what has surprised me is when people feel rejected, it almost creates this inherent um, negativity, obsession, and insecurity, which then leads to all sorts of things like harassment, abuse, toxicity. 
And it's been fascinating to me how quickly someone can feel rejected on the internet, right? If someone doesn't respond to them or someone says something they don't like, it just breeds this insecurity that we all, you know, do see in real life. But the other thing that has surprised me is the power of positivity. Um, it's actually shocking to see the data, and we have a lot of it. When you send a non-punitive warning uh, and you make it more of a hand-holding, kind uh, reminder, it is fascinating to see what happens. So if you take this lens of punishment or punitive uh, action, people don't respond well to that. People really want to defend themselves and they want to stand up for themselves and they want to blame, right? And it's really remarkable to see what happens when you say things like please or you add a smiley face or you add a heart. It just softens the entire reaction and we've done this from day one. So, you know, our product has always been about speaking to the customer in a kind manner and we've used bees as our mechanism to translate that. That's been our translation is, and by the way, like a whole nother tangent is the, this like incredible society of bees, right? The way the bees all behave, it's just like a, an amazing ecosystem. So we've really taken this, this positivity, positivity approach and it really translates to real data and real, um, real beneficial outcomes in terms of how people shift their behavior. So if you have someone that was upset about something, you resp responded them with kindness, all of a sudden they're like, thank you so much. I'm so sorry that I was mean. Please forgive me. It just creates this like contagious kindness reaction. And so that's been really fascinating. So I'm kind of curious, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about a little bit uh, in our various other conversations is this idea that so many other tech CEOs from Mark Zuckerberg to Jack Dorsey to sort of like the, the masters of the universe of tech bros um, have spent the last, uh, you know, couple of years, really since the 2016 election, essentially arguing that things that happen on their platform are not their problem <laughs> or that the, the, or or that the way uh, people behave on Facebook or Twitter is not something that is uh, their responsibility. I'm curious what you think of that stance um, and why you might have a slightly different approach. Well, I think they believe that, right? I think they actually fundamentally believe that. I think that if you look at these products, none of them were created with the intention of solving for bad behavior. None of them were created with intentionality around changing behavior for better outcomes, right? These platforms were basically built to provide access and that's it. It was an access point, right? How do I connect person A to connect person B in the quickest way possible? How do I allow someone to say whatever they want in this town hall format? I, you can't put things back into a box, right? Once things are out there, they're out there. And I don't even think it's just these CEOs. I think that it's their customer base, right? So you can't just knock on the door of customers 10 years in and say, hey, by the way, you can't do this anymore. We're, we've changed our mind. There's a new set of rules. Why I believe it works at Bumble is we've done this from day one. I mean, if you were to look at our very first script of wireframing, right, 2014 mock-ups, the even pre-Bumble mock-up was called Moxie with the safety pin. The safety pin was our icon before it was Bumble with the Hive to insinuate that this is a safer platform that will have your back. This is going to engineer a kinder, more respectful uh, you know, set of behavior and, 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 and engagement. And not only that, but we're going to name our product Moxie, which means to have bravery and to be, to, you know, have gall and to you know, go for it. And so that was the pre-brand before Bumble. So, you know, when you think about the intentionality behind everything we did, I mean, from the, the, the push notifications, right? From what the screen says to you, this was all engineered strategically to create a kinder, less toxic environment. And the the reality is those other products just weren't, right? And so they've never felt that they've promised that or that that's their responsibility. Now, do I agree with their approach? Obviously, I have a very different, you know, um, 
mindset on this topic. But that's truly what I believe is they just, they never promised to be this, right? And now they've got this, this systemic issue that I think is one of the biggest issues of this generation and certainly the next generation because if you look at screen time, you know, children live on their phones more than they do in real life now. And who are they engaging with? So on that note, you know, what do you think, I, I think a lot of people are concerned about what you just said. Um, what do you think, how does the tech industry need to change in order to um, embrace sort of more humanity on the internet? Yeah, I mean, I think you can't be scared to kick someone out of the bar, right? Even if they're a good customer, buy another metric, even if they buy a lot of beers, right? If they behave poorly, they need to be kicked out of the bar and the digital version of that. And that's that's my fundamental belief and setting a set of guidelines and setting a set of, um, you know, current guidelines that actually take care of current modern issues. And for example, you know, Bumble uh, just has added, we've, we've been doing a lot of education work on the leadership team and across the board. And our team has really helped us see some of the discrepancies that we missed, like fetishization or body shaming. You know, we always said there's no harassment allowed here. Or there's no, you know, abuse allowed here, but there, that's very nuanced. There's a lot of nuances to those words, right? And so we've gone and constantly optimized and said, you cannot use our product to behave this way. You cannot body shame. You cannot shame someone for their age or their ability or their health. And these are things that I don't know, maybe they are, but I don't know if these other companies are necessarily thinking about this, right? Because there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I think you just have to pick what do you care about as a company and who are you trying to protect and what problem are you trying to solve? And then you have to hold yourself accountable to that. And when you have to start kicking people off your product when they don't agree with it, you have to be okay with that. And so, you know, it's, it's funny because this is something that I think is bubbling up in a lot on a lot of different platforms right now, not just um, relationship building platforms like yours. So, but what do you say to people who say, you know, uh, I'm being kicked off for an unfair reason or I have a right to exist on the internet? Do you think people have a right to exist on these platforms on the, on the internet? I think that if there are no terms and conditions and there are no guidelines, it is very hard to argue against that, right? But when you have very clear terms and conditions that someone has agreed to saying, I will not call somebody these names, or I will not use hate speech, or I will not shame someone for X, Y, and Z. And when they do that, you can point back to their 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 um, invasion of that. It's, it's very similar to business in the streets, right? There might be a pizza shop that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. And if you walk in without shoes and a shirt, you're going to be asked to leave, but the sign is on the wall, it's on the door. So if you don't have that sign on the door, I know I'm using this metaphorical kind of analogy for, for, for rules, but if you don't have that sign on the door and you just tell someone to leave, you're going to have people that don't understand why. So I think you know these companies need to have their own digital sign on the door, whatever they stand for. And if if certain businesses don't want to enforce that, that's their own thing to worry about. But that's how you start shifting behavior, in my opinion, is you have to decide what sign are you going to put on the door and hold people accountable. And so what I'm curious what you and Bumble really have learned through the pandemic. Um, what, you know, what has the pandemic taught you about how people build relationships, how they maintain relationships when they can't physically see each other, and sort of uh, how important actual in-person contact is to, you know, to, to building a good relationship. Yeah, I mean, this has been so fascinating. I mean, truly, we are a relationship company, right? Like we, we, we exist because we help people go meet each other. So you can imagine March 2020 was a very confusing time. But our recent survey has been so amazing in the sense that it has illuminated all of these truths that we've been seeing through our data, but now it's kind of justified by customer feedback that 
the stigma around online dating is essentially gone, right? It is essentially gone. And 65% of the survey respondents said that they believe they can fall in love without meeting someone in real life first, that they can actually form such a deep connection with someone digitally, whether that's using our FaceTime product or using audio features, or even just communicating through writing. They fundamentally believe 65% are open to and believe that they can find love without meeting in person. And so, you know, that is a shocking statistic. And the other shocking statistic that has come out of this is that yeah, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll have to pull it up for you at some point, that a lot of people want to meet through video before they actually meet in real life. So the digital barrier actually is a prerequisite for a lot of women now, meaning I actually prefer to meet whomever on a dating app because I've seen 10 of their photos, I've read their bio, I know so much more about this individual than I would have ever gathered at a coffee shop. And to make sure he's not someone I'm scared of or someone I'm unattracted to, I'm going to do a five minute video date, even three minute video date, make sure this person is someone I have chemistry with and then meet them in real life. And it's been really um, amazing. And I think the statistics around 40% prefer video first dating before they actually meet in real life. So that's a remarkable statistic that did not exist before the pandemic, even though we had conviction in that the pandemic almost solidified that in a strange, but positive way, I would say, because it really enforces safety and not wasting your time and you no know, understanding who you're about to meet. Oh, and by the way, we're opening our first coffee shop in New York, Charlotte, so you have to go. It opens in July. It's very, very cute and bumbly, and it's on Kenmare Street, so we'll give you more details. I will definitely go get, go there. <laughs> I, I will okay. go anywhere where there's iced coffee. Um, great. Well, Whitney, <laughs> Whitney Wolfhard, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such a fun conversation. Thanks, Charlotte. Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, IBM, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, Mount Sinai, PayPal, Walton Family Foundation, Verizon, and YouTube. Also, thanks to Prudential and the Rise Fund. For many of us, this past year has been one of the hardest in memory, but not all was dark. We asked a few past Aspen Ideas speakers and fellows where are you finding delight? The pandemic has taught me to find delight in the little things. That taste of my morning coffee or my husband's smile. It's taught me to be present in more ways than I was before. Birds, specifically warblers. I've spent an hour or so in the small patch of woods near my home that's a warbler magnet during spring migration. Family dinner time. Family, friends, walking the dog while listening to podcasts and Zwift. Wonderful excesses of time with my family, including our three dogs. Female friends. Early in the pandemic, one drove 20 minutes to deliver a mega pack of toilet paper. Another laid an armful of tulips at my front door. Another noticed me looking pale on Zoom, and she said nothing, but she pushed a new tube of red lipstick through my nail slots. What would we do without girlfriends? Well, pizza and cocktails, to be sure, but the Neapolitan novels of Elena Ferrante, which I discovered about 10 years after the rest of the world, have lifted me in a dark way. I didn't grow bored, but rather ever more appreciative of the pleasures of family and friends, of personal life and daily rituals, meals, books, movies, phone calls, a swim or sledding down a hill. COVID made me more introverted or sentimental or maybe just stupidly grateful for health and love than I've ever been before. If you want to know about the future of the city, Chicago's mayor, Lori Lightfoot, is a good person to talk to. She's not only navigating the windy city in the present, but she's dealing with her city's past. James Anderson of Bloomberg Philanthropies asks her what's on the horizon, near term and long term for American municipalities. I'm Jim Anderson from Bloomberg Philanthropies, and it's such a pleasure to be here with Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Madam Mayor, welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jim. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, and let me start with a huge congratulations. On June 11th, Chicago became the 
largest big city in America to fully reopen. I know that took a tremendous amount of hard work and a big congrats are in order. Well, thank you. And really the con congratulations belong uh, to the residents of my great city who, as you know, along with people all across the world endured a tremendous burden um, throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, but really, I think Buckle Down followed um, the science uh, and the public health directives and really got us to uh, the place that we are in right now and still continuing to work um, to make sure that we get more and more people uh, vaccinated. But I'm excited that the city is really coming alive. Uh, that's so exciting. Um, and it's been almost 18 months to the day since Chicago became the second city in the country uh, with a recorded case of COVID-19. So take me back to January 24th, 2020. What was going through your head? Did you have any sense of what your city was in for and did anything that unfolded over the next 18 months go according to plan? <laughs> well, uh, th those are big questions. Um, you know, we, we started paying attention, uh, our public health started paying attention to uh, the pandemic um, really back in December of 19. And when it became uh, clear that this was a very large, dangerous virus, watching it seem like it was consuming all of China, then spreading to Southeast Asia, and then leaping over to Europe, um, I felt like it was only a matter of time and before it hit our shores. And then, of course, it did. Um, mostly initially seemed to be from travelers coming from China to either coast, but as we saw it, you know, reaching the shores of uh, California and then New York and spreading there and then slowly but surely making its way to uh, the Midwest, um, you know, we, we started doing a number of different things to make sure that we were prepared. And luckily, our public health department prepares all year round particularly when it comes to having equipment. You know, you remember those crazy times where people were sending uh, briefcases of cash <clears throat> on flights to far-flung places to find ventilators, PPE, all kinds of other basic equipment that was necessary for testing. Um, we didn't have that problem here in Chicago. I, I like to think that we were one of the most prepared, not just cities, but locations in the country because of the continuous stockpiling of equipment in climate control facilities and being very, very diligent about that really set us up in a very different place than a lot of other uh, locations across the country, including our own state government. Um, but those were days where nobody really understood what was happening. Uh, the virus was something that um, people were still scrambling to understand. Uh, the guidance that we were getting from the CDC at the beginning of the uh, pandemic until we really had a better handle on things months later, radically different. Um, so we were in very uncharted territory um, and trying to literally do the things that we felt were necessary to try to save people's lives. Some of those early, very difficult uh, decisions shutting down our schools, shutting down hotels and restaurants and our convention business. Um, those were hard, painful uh, decisions. And even at the time, I was thinking and hoping this would be a matter of months. Never in my wildest dreams back in February, March, that I think we would be a year plus um, and still not out of the throes of the pandemic. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's incredible to think about how much has transpired. And 18 months later, a number of your fellow mayors have decided not to run for re-election. Mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms cites her decision to fatigue, exhaustion, and sadness. Yeah. So how did you manage the fatigue during that grueling 18 months? And was there ever a moment where you thought to yourself, this is too much? Well, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty tough and I'm not somebody who gives up. But I was really fortunate to have a tremendous team around me. Um, and that's the only way uh, to, that I would have ever been able to get through this. As I said, this is really uncharted territory, I think, for everybody. Uh, from the President of the United States uh, to world leaders, um, 
This was something that was so different, so vast, and so scary because of so many unknowns. And watching uh, people die and the suffering that came so suddenly, like this tidal wave across the across the world, across our continent, um, was a frightening thing to behold. But my team, and particularly um, our great public health uh, department and leadership, uh, really um, gave me confidence to persevere. I mean, we we did it all hands on deck, as many leaders did across um, the, the country and the world. Uh, I, I think we worked from really from the end of February through the end of May, seven days a week without a break. Um, and there were days that I would tumble into bed once I finally was able to get home, so exhausted, but unable to sleep because just processing what had happened that day and then knowing that there was a whole bevy of new challenges um, that awaited uh, the very next day. So those were really difficult, difficult times. But for me personally, um, I'm very committed to making sure that I finish what I start. And my city needed me, needed me to be strong, needed me to tell it to them um, straight, um, and really led with the data and the science, um, transparency, uh, but also uh, really focused in on equity. One of the signature moments that I will probably never forget for the rest of my life is when we started seeing the data that black people in the city were dying at seven times the rate of any other demographic. That was a breathtaking moment, but a moment that um, I knew we had to rise to the occasion and not just share bad news with people, but really come up with very concrete solutions, and we did. And you continue to build on that progress. Last week, you declared racism a public health crisis, joining a number of other cities in doing so. What led to that declaration specifically, and how do you hope it'll make a difference? Looking at the root causes of a lot of the healthcare and life expectancy disparities that we see, there's a straight line that leads to systemic racism. The absence of um, investments in healthcare, um, in um, jobs, in healthy eating options for uh, communities of color, but also just the lack of investment in human capital all of those things are as a result of, you know, decades, but probably longer, of systemic racism, intentional exclusion of black and brown poor communities from access to the wealth of this great city. So I'm a firm believer in facing hard truths, and this was one that was so obvious, so evident. And what I think it, it allows us to do is to really then dig into what are the root causes, how do we start righting historic wrongs? But we can't do that work without uh, making that declaration and calling it what it is. And we also announce at the same time um, healthcare equity uh, teams that were divided by geography based on place-based strategies that we're going to use to start addressing in a much more systematic way the systemic racism that has plagued our city for way too long. So it was making the declaration but as I always like to do, coming behind that immediately with concrete solutions to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, in reading the coverage of your announcement, I, I, I read that you talked about your parents and how their own aspirations were uh, stifled by the realities of the segregation in the South in the 1920s. Would they have fared better in today's Chicago? That's a great question. In some ways, yes, in some ways, no. You know, I think Chicago definitely over the years has offered um, glimmers of more opportunity uh, than the segregated South. But as Dr. King noted when he came here uh, in the late 60s, um, the racism that he faced, uh, that was out front, the anger and, at, at um, Dr. King and other civil rights leaders having the audacity to call the racism in a city, northern city like Chicago, that resistance that led to riots um, against him and others, that's no different than a kind of um, violent racism that my parents experienced, my father growing up in Arkansas, my mother uh, growing up in um, Alabama. When your whole life's function, the, literally your physical movements, 
your thoughts, your access to any kind of opportunity, and even your joy is circumscribed by racism and the fear of uh, enraging a white um, population that could turn like this and snuff out your life without any uh, fear of accountability. It's hard to even imagine living that in that environment, but that is truly the environment that both of my parents grew up in. And I think my mother, to some extent, was able to overcome it, um, coming north and with family supports. But for my father, that shaped his entire world vision to the day that he died. Um, you know, you inherited in Chicago one of the toughest gun violence crises in the nation. Um, and like your city, like so many, is really struggling with this issue in an ongoing way. Last week, you uh, were part of rallying mayors to urge President Biden to do more faster. What is the path forward here? And what are you hoping to see from the White House uh, in the near term? Well, I, I think there's, this is a, has to be a multi-tiered strategy. Um, on the ground here locally, we were focused on the 15 areas of our city that drive about 30% of our violent crime. And we believe that if we can make significant progress in those areas, well, that will redound to the benefit of the entire city. And incrementally, we're seeing some progress. Um, June over June, we've de we're definitely in a better place than we were last year, although last year was also a historic high. But year, year to date, we're seeing a consistent downward trend in homicides and shootings, which means we're getting traction. And one barometer uh, that I really think is important, we're seeing a steady increase in our homicide clearance rate. You can't get there without the public believing in some level of legitimacy of the police department, because we're seeing cooperation like we haven't seen in a very long time. So that I think is good progress, but we've got to continue using not just hard power, but the soft power of government to be a convening force for our city agencies, to understand that all of them have skin in this game, but also to bring in community partners so that if we're able to clear a block or a corner or a location, then we build up capacity on the ground with local indigenous residents and stakeholders to hold that territory with overlay with city resources and support. So that I think is the long and the, sh the short and the long game for city. But you may ask the question about what can the federal government do? I think there's a tremendous amount of low hanging fruit and I look forward to uh, the president's announcement um, on these issues. Number one, we know that in Chicago, most of the guns that are coming into our city are coming in from different states and surrounding um, suburban gun dealers. ATM needs to be, or sorry, ATF needs to be fully empowered to do oversight of federally licensed gun dealers. We've got to make sure that they're playing it straight, playing by the rules, and that they know that there's accountability if they continue to uh, sell to straw purchasers um, or cut corners in any way. My last question to you, under the wire, um, you've reopened your city, your city's coming back to life. You're probably beginning to think more about the future. Um, what does Build Back Better mean for Chicago and where do you see the biggest opportunity for progress? I think we've got to demonstrate to our residents who have really been carrying extraordinary burdens over these last uh, 15 plus months that we hear them, we see them, and we're coming with real solutions to their problems. People have to feel the recovery. The people in our communities, the small business owners, uh, the person who's worried about whether or not they're gonna be able to keep a job, the person who's seeking a job. Our focus has to be on dealing with our structural uh, fiscal issues for sure, but if our residents don't feel this recovery in their pocketbook, if they don't feel a sense of relief, that the government sees them and is willing to help, uh, give a helping hand to help them overcome their economic fears and realities, then this will all be for naught. So we've got to get resources into 
communities into individuals. So we've been doing a big examination of where are the pain points for our residents and how can we best address them. Well, that is a great note to end on. Mayor Lightfoot, thank you very much. My pleasure. Last month, Aspen and the world lost George Stranahan. He was a physicist, philosopher, philanthropist, polymath, and a person who knew how to make things happen. In 1962, he approached the Aspen Institute with a big idea that physicists should have a place to gather outside an academic setting, to work and to talk and to have picnic lunches in the shade of Aspen trees. That idea became the physics division of the Aspen Institute, housed right here in this sage-filled meadow. It's now the independent Aspen Center of Physics and hosts thousands of working physicists, including many Nobel Prize winners. Many physicists work to formulate a theory of everything. Stranahan's theory seemed to be that he could do everything. He was a teacher as well as a tavern keeper. He was a rancher, a brewer, an author, a photographer, and a passionate advocate for free speech. And he was all these things at the same time. As a young man, he received a sizable inheritance and used it to pursue a laundry list of world-improving ideas, founding a variety of educational and social justice organizations. But he also found time for stranger pursuits. And today his name is most recognizable on the label of a high-end Colorado whiskey. Aspen and the Institute will miss him, his boundless energy, his infectious optimism, his limitless imagination. He will always be a hero to those who thirst for knowledge, for justice, and for a cold pint of pale ale. While we work to welcome a greater number of visitors to our campus in Aspen, Colorado, we'd like to share small snapshots of our campus that not only show you this place, but also how it is relevant to the spirit of the Aspen Institute. The Buckminster Fuller Dome adjacent to Anderson Park. Its original location was in a different part of campus and was used to help control light and temperature at the health center pool. It was constructed in the early 1950s with help from students of his at the University of Minnesota. Fuller visited campus again in 1964 as a participant at a conference on technological change and social responsibility, also attended by Thurgood Marshall. Today, the dome is used as a meeting space and seminar room and has hosted many Aspen Ideas Festival conversations. We would like to thank all of our generous underwriters, the organizations that make this digital festival possible. And now, the long view, the very long view, potentially in a galaxy far, far away. Jill Tarter, founder of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, talks with Garrett Graff about taking a cosmic perspective and how the search for alien life helps us think more clearly about humanity's future. Hi there, I'm Garrett Graff. I'm a journalist, historian, and the director of the Aspen Digital Cybersecurity Initiative here at the Aspen Institute. And I am joined today for this wonderful Aspen Ideas Festival conversation with Dr. Jill Tarter, the co-founder of the SETI Institute and one of the most renowned and fascinating astronomers and scientists of our age. Thank you, Garrett. It's very nice to be here. So this last year has seen a remarkable sea change in the way that our government and our society in some ways talks about the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence, that we are seeing uh, senior U.S. officials talk about unexplained phenomenon in the skies over our heads. And this, of course, is all coming on the heels of the Oumuamua uh, interstellar object that passed through our solar system uh, in, in recent years and, and has caused us to think differently about the possibility of things from beyond our own worlds. I mean, in some ways, our national dialogue have uh, has seemed to catch up to where you have spent most of your career? Well, yes, in some ways, and no, in other ways. Um, Garrett, when we got started with this uh, 
attempt to systematically search the electromagnetic spectrum for evidence of someone else's technology, uh, we went to great lengths to make a big distinction, distance, between the, the scientific exploration that we were undertaking and the pseudoscience of UFOs and other crazy ideas. Um, and we've, we've worked hard to make that distinction all along. And so now what's happening is that people are uh, admitting that there's a lot of physics that we don't yet understand. When we started, there was this real question about hmm, uh, pilots, presumably good observers, were seeing lights above thunderclouds, right? And it wasn't until we had orbiting satellites looking down at Earth with high time resolution that we learned that lightning travels up as well as down. And now we have a whole study of things we called sprites and elves. And it's physics. It isn't extraterrestrials, right? And I think that's what's happening here. Um, we have a lot of people who have, frankly, manipulated the government and found funding for themselves uh, by hyping this idea. And there are other people who have looked at the data and said, no, these are internal camera reflections or they're camera motions or they're not some um, kind of aircraft or spacecraft. Um, but they don't get listened to quite as, as, as much. So we have this, um, again, uh, confounding of actual science and um, speculative and exciting storytelling. And we need, to, we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to, to make sure that the people who have made studies and have explanations for these get listened to. You have talked a lot about, over the course of your career, sort of drawing this distinction between the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the probability of extraterrestrial life. Um, and, and in some ways, just the, the sheer odds of the number of stars, the number of planets around stars, augurs well that life does exist somewhere out there, but it may not be in a way that can communicate with us or that we will ever notice. What do you make of this sort of moment in our fascination with what lies beyond and how, how do you sort of see our fascination with the search for extraterrestrial life playing out over the years ahead? From the very first time we walked out of the caves and looked up and looked over across the valley to the hills beyond, we wondered what was out there. And we have long wondered how we fit in to this cosmos. And we are increasingly eager to understand our place uh, and whether we are absolutely garden variety normal, whether we're unique, because it could still be, even with the large numbers, that we are unique, or whether we're really um, kind of at the bottom of the pecking order and that there are other cultures and technologies out there that are far more capable than we are. So we really have always wanted to calibrate our position in the cosmos. And now that we have increasing technology and more observational tools, and we're looking at the universe in ways that we've never been able to do before, uh, we're being able to set some limits, set some boundaries, um, while still understanding that this is a really vast exploration that we're trying to accomplish. I like to tell people that numerically, if you consider all the different parameters that we need to explore to uh, perhaps discover an electromagnetic signal from some other technology, there are nine different parameters. And if you make an estimate of how much each parameter covers, 
and then make a nine dimensional volume out of that. I'm not really good at visualizing it, but I can do this experiment. I can say, let's take the volume that we need to explore and set that equal to the volume of all the Earth's oceans. And how much of those oceans have we explored? And when I first did the, this calculation, when SETI was 50 years old, um, it, the answer was one, one glass of water out of the oceans. And now, a decade later, it's more like a small hot tub, right? So um, we haven't done a very good job yet in this exploration, but it will get better and it will get faster, mainly because of the improvement in computing technologies and the new telescopes that we're putting on the uh, to look at the sky. I mean, I find this question of the magnitude of the work of the search ahead just one of the most humbling uh, 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 questions that we've wrestled with. Um, and it leads to this very profound and I think almost sad conclusion that simultaneously life elsewhere seems very probable, but that it also seems uh, entirely possible that we may never find it. Um, and, and I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about what you think it means for humanity if we're ever able to find that there is life somewhere out there, even if we're never able to tell exactly what it is uh, and what it looks like. Well, I think this whole um, enterprise of trying to find life beyond Earth does something that's profoundly important. Because when we think about ourselves and when we think about the possibility of something else beyond Earth, I think it has the effect of holding a mirror up to all of us on this planet. And when we look in a mirror, we think that I'm different than you are and you're different than someone else. And we, we worry about race and ethnicity and skin color and all of this. But in that mirror, that the concept of life beyond Earth provides us, it tells us that actually we're all the same. It trivializes the differences among humans, um, differences that we're willing to spill blood over, right? And it says, you know, compared to something else that might be out there, humans are all the same. And so I think it's really important to keep making that point and trying to shift our perspectives collectively to a more cosmic perspective. Because we face all of these challenges, climate change and food and water instability and great poverty and illness. We face all of these challenges, which the pandemic has really reminded us, do not respect national boundaries. And to solve them, to find solutions, we're going to have to act cooperatively and collaboratively. We're going to have to act together as Earthlings to solve these great challenges if we're going to have a long future. Because there are lots of things that indicate that perhaps our future is not so long, but may be very short. And so I love the fact that people are interested in the idea of life beyond Earth. And when we get a chance to talk to them about the idea, we also get a chance to encourage them to view themselves as Earthlings and to act like it. Uh, what you're talking about is also the, the thesis of Oxford philosopher Toby Ord's book, The Precipice, about how important it is that humans really look at the existential threat to mankind right now, to humankind, uh, and consider all of the innovation and exploration that we might be cutting off uh, if we don't take that long view um, and sort of the eons of generations ahead uh, and what all of uh, mankind and humankind might be able to do down the road. And it's a fascinating way to sort of rethink the way that we think of ourselves as less now and more sort of what what we might be uh, possible of, you know, thousands or millions of years down the road.
well, there aren't going to be thousands or millions of years down the road if we don't get this right. Yeah. And, you know, there's no planet B. And unless we solve these problems here on our own home world, um, there's no sense in talking about, well, we'll go somewhere else once we've messed, once, once we've trashed this place, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. But, you know, technically that might be possible, but it wouldn't work because we just do the same mistakes there. Yeah. We, um, we really have to get our act together and um, solve these challenges right here, right now. You were a, a big part, obviously, of the Carl Sagan uh, contact uh, book and movie uh, with, with Jodie Foster, um, based in many ways on, on your own work. And one of the things that you have said in your career is the way that we think of aliens and extraterrestrial life in sci-fi often seems wrong uh, because it says more about us than it does about them. And, and I wonder if, if you could sort of explain what you mean about uh, effectively why we shouldn't necessarily fear life from other planets if and when we ever encounter it. Well, first of all, <laughs> long before CGI, all we had were human actors and latex, right? And so the aliens always ended up looking pretty much like us. Uh, we've been able to expand our, our uh, concepts through computer graphics. But um, it's important to, to understand that our star in this region of our galaxy, the Milky Way, is on average about a billion years younger than the other stars in this uh, sector. So it's quite possible that if another technology has evolved uh, around another star, it could be a lot older than we are. And we worry and we have these, um, you know, fantasies about, oh, they're just gonna, they're gonna come and eat us up, right? Or it's, it's really threatening to think about life from some other world. And I, I don't feel that way. So if they can get here, Right, they have more technology than we have. They're presumably a lot older than we are. And how have they managed to get to be an old civilization? I think that um, I'm I'm in the um, I'm in agreement with um, Steven Pinker, who talks about we are now kinder and gentler than we have ever been in our history thanks to cultural evolution becoming a, a strong factor in how we, uh, how we mature. And I think that any old civilization which has managed to sustain itself has therefore had to outgrow the um, really aggressive tendencies that probably helped them to become intelligent in the first place, and that they are probably kinder and gentler than our society today. And so I don't have a great fear of the other. And I'm really eager to find an opportunity, a way, if you wish, to ask them, how did you do it? How did you manage to, to um, overcome your technological adolescence? That's where we are today. Mm -hmm. How did you make it? Because I think there might be a lot to learn. Dr. Jill Carter, thanks so much for joining us at the Aspen Ideas Festival here. Garrett, it's been great fun. Thank you for having me. Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, IBM, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, Mount Sinai, PayPal, Walton Family Foundation, Verizon, and YouTube. Also, thanks to Prudential and the RISE Fund. And that's the close of day three of the 2021 Aspen Ideas Festival. Tomorrow evening, we'll have events starting at 5 p.m. Mountain Time when we'll rethink the U.S.'s relationship to China, dig into how the legacy of slavery still shapes America, and explore new ways for students to communicate with teachers. But remember that there's exciting programming all day with breakout sessions beginning at 9.30 a.m. Mountain Time. So rise and shine. You can see the complete schedule at aspenideas.info forward slash 2021. Thanks again for attending day three.